So, of course, all of us have had the hiccups. Um, hiccups are caused uh, typically, according to the Mayo Clinic, by eating large meals or eating too quickly, chewing gum, um, drinking carbonated beverages, drinking too much alcohol, um, getting excited suddenly, or even stress, which I did not know. And of course, uh, most of us know of ways to make them stop. At least there are things we've heard that supposedly make hiccups stop. Who here has heard of things that make hiccups stop? Okay. And of course, when somebody's hiccuping and they have a hard time and it goes on for a few more minutes than we expect, um, most of us are usually willing to share some type of thing that hopefully would help the person, but never does. It never seems to, to help. Now, there are a lot of different ways to, to try to stop hiccups. It's an old thing. It's been going on for a long time, ever since there's been people. But in 16th century English, um, people used to say that it is good, quote, it is good to cast cold water in the face of him that hath the hicket. And so they didn't call it hiccups. They were the hicket. So again, it is good to cast cold water in the face of him that hath the hicket. I bet that did not work. But I bet it was fun. You know? I mean, it's probably just for the person throwing the water. But there's all sorts of things that people say would work, like scaring someone, breathing into a paper bag, um, pull your knees up to your chest and lean forward, pressing against your diaphragm. The idea is to push out the air. Uh, sip ice cold water, drink a glass of water quickly, drink a glass of water slowly, gargle with water, drink pickle juice, swallow a teaspoon of granulated sugar, place a couple drops on vinegar on your tongue, bite a slice of lemon, hold your breath for a short time, pull on your tongue, pressing lightly on your diaphragm, uh, placing gentle pressure on each side of the nose while swallowing, Hold your breath and swallow three times. Hold your breath and swallow 10 times. Hold your breath for 10 seconds, then inhale two times before exhaling, which would be hard to remember, and I think I'd be hiccuping the whole time. Charles Osborne um, had hiccups, and he had hiccups for a long time. After an accident in 1922, he started hiccuping. He didn't stop for years, and in 1936, he had been hiccuping nonstop since 1922. He was on a radio show interview where he shared his struggles, and thousands of people all over the United States heard the show and, and sent in their remedies. He tried every single one of them, and nothing worked. He struggled with soreness because of his diaphragm uh, spasming so much. He struggled with insomnia for years, and ultimately hiccuped a Guinness Book World Record, 68 years straight. So for 68 years, he could not stop hiccuping. He hiccuped 20 to 40 times per minute. It's estimated that over that period of 68 years, he had 430 million hiccups. Later in life, he shared in an interview, I would give every single thing I have in this world to be rid of these hiccups. That's a physical problem. In 1948, or 1848, Phineas Gage was working as a railroad foreman in the upper um, Northeast. And as he was working on the railroad, he was trying to set a charge. He had a tamping iron that was about one and a quarter thick, uh, one inch and a quarter thick, and was three feet, seven inches long. It weighed about 14 pounds. And he was using that to, to tamp uh, sand, to, to pack the hole so that the explosion would be more effective. And when he was doing that, it somehow ignited and it shot up like a bullet. It went in underneath his left eye and out the top of his head, separating his frontal lobe from the rest of his brain. He never lost consciousness. Um, they rushed him to the doctor. The doctor actually at one point was putting one finger through the top of his head and one finger through the hole here and was touching his fingers. And the whole time, Phineas Gage was speaking. He recovered physically, but his personality was changed. And we understand a lot about personalities today and, and many different things that can happen to somebody through, through physical trauma because of what happened to Phineas Gage. 
That's an emotional problem. Roy Sullivan, um, from 1942 to 1977, was a National Park Service ranger. His nickname was the Human Lightning Rod. And the reason why he was called the Human Lightning Rod is he was struck by lightning more times than any person has ever been struck by lightning. He was struck by lightning seven times in his lifetime, actually eight, but he could only prove seven, three times in the head. After he was struck by lightning the sixth time, he saw a cloud that was following him, and he believed that God was out to get him. And so he began to carry a bucket of water everywhere he went. Listen, whether your problems are physical, emotional, or spiritual, God is able to make all things new. He can fix anything. And he loves us, and he's also able, meaning he's powerful. There's nothing too hard for the Lord. And that's why the scripture gives us these encouraging words in 2 Corinthians 5.17. We quote them often, but they're words that we need to really grab a hold of and let sink deep. If any man, if any woman be in Christ, he or she is a new creation, and the old things have passed away, all things have become new. When we encounter people who are dealing with difficulty, we don't always think through what that verse says, even though most of us know it very well. If any man, if any woman be in Christ, he or she is a new creation. They're not the same person they were before. And so when God gets a hold of a life, he changes everything. And he can change anything that needs to be changed. I don't think there's an example of that more profound in our day than when we see somebody who's struggling with some type of life dominating sin or struggling with some type of issue of addiction because we live in a culture that that understates what can happen as far as change in a person's life because people are limited. And those there in the world that, that seek to care for people really give remedies or those that are trying to minister to the emotions or the mental needs. They speak a lot of coping, meaning dealing with the problem, but there's no healing. And because of this, those that have struggled with addiction have been sold a lie, oftentimes told, you're always going to be an addict because that's who you are. Well, not so. If any man, if any woman be in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, All things have become new. And if God's word says all things have become new, then all things have become new. And God takes over and he cleanses everything. And he does a work that only he can do, setting things right. Now, some things, of course, he changes just like that in a moment. Other things may take time. But the reality is he makes all things new. Now, for us as believers in Jesus Christ, if if you have been born again, if you've been converted, if you've been changed, if you've experienced the the love of God and capturing your heart, forgiving you of your sins, giving you salvation, making you a new creation, then the truth is there is the you you were, and then there is the you you are. And if you haven't yet met God, if you're not sure that you are saved, If you've never been converted, then there is the you you were, and there also is the you you can be. But either way, God is able. Amen? He is able to do something that no one else can do, so that there would be the old you, who you were, and all your problems, whatever they might be, and then there is the new you, the you that God has remade you to be. Notice the old you, because we see both the old you and the new you in this text. The old you is there in verses 17 through 19. It says this, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility or the uselessness or emptiness of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. It goes on to say, but you have not so learned Christ. Meaning that's a hinge right there. 
Those verses, verses 17 through 19, are talking about who you were. It's not talking about who you are as a Christian. It's who you were. It's who you used to be, who every single person used to be. Now, of course, a lot of people you know, want to say, you know, well, God doesn't exist, or that they don't believe in God, or that they don't have a God. But the truth is, everybody has a God. It was written a long time ago, but Bob Dylan wrote a song called Gotta Serve Somebody, and he was right. Everybody's going to serve somebody. It may be the devil, it may be the Lord, but everybody is going to serve somebody, and it's true. Every single person will, in fact, serve someone, and that's what this passage here is actually talking about because it says this in verse 17, This I say, therefore, in testifying the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. That is, you should no longer walk as those who are on the outside. Those who are non-believers, you shall no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. That word futility, empty, useless, profitless, it's actually the word to describe idol worship. So in other words, you shall no longer walk with a mind of idols given over to idols. Whatever that idol might be. It's not just simply saying uselessness or wastefulness. The idea is it's what happens when you give your mind over to something other than God. And so don't have a mind that thinks about useless, wasteful, empty things. Don't have a mind that thinks of idols or is given over to idols. Now, when we talk about idols, it's important for us to be able to understand what we're referring to, because, of course, many idols in the Old and New Testament had names, and many of them had statues. You know, some of you have that type of background. I had that type of background. But most of you here in this room probably didn't. So when you think of idols and avoiding idols, you think, well, I can pretty much avoid that. You know, I haven't been able to avoid this, 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 and this, but I don't think I'm guilty as far as the issue of idols. Well, hold on. Idols really could be defined as a master passion. So anything that you live for that's not God is an idol. So if you haven't always lived for God, which none of us have always lived for God, then we were idol worshipers. And sometimes idols can be something that's right there in front of you that you know is an idol, like something like money or success or drugs or alcohol or sex or pleasure. But sometimes it can be a little more subtle. Sometimes an idol could be your marriage or your family, something that's good but it's out of place. Sometimes an idol could be something even spiritual, like, for example, ministry can become an idol for some people. The idea of serving and having people acknowledge that you're serving can become an idol for some people. The idea of being spiritual, I'm not sure exactly what that means, but people say it a lot, that can become an idol. And so there's lots of different things that can become an idol. Anything that you live for that is not God is an idol. And that's something we need to avoid, like the plague. Turn your Bibles with me over to Psalm 115, please. Psalm 115. Notice what it says here in Psalm 115. Now in this psalm... It's talking about idols, meaning literal idols, physical idols that people were worshiping back in the day. It's important that we understand this, that idol worship in any sort is degrading. And the reason why idol worship is degrading, meaning it's degrading to the person who's doing it, is you become just like what you worship. And that's an important thing for us to understand. Whatever we worship, we become like that thing. Notice what Psalm 115 verse 4 says. It says, their idols, meaning those who worship idols, their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk. Nor do they mutter through their throat. So in other words, they can't speak. Those who make them are like them, 
so is everyone who trusts in them. Notice verse eight again. Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. So again, idol worship is degrading. You become just like what you worship. If you worship money, then you become a miser. If you worship sex, you become a pervert. If you worship alcohol, you become a drunkard. If you worship drugs, you become an addict. If you worship entertainment, you become bored. If you worship fame, you become insecure. If you worship power, you become fearful. If you worship education or knowledge or your intellect, you become stupid, which I know a lot of people don't like the word stupid. I love the word stupid. And it's used in the Bible, those who resist instruction or do not heed instruction, those who can't be taught, those who think they know it all, are stupid. It's a fun word to say. You know, I mean, English doesn't have a lot of fun words to say, but stupid, it's just a fun word to say. I can't say stupid without smiling sometimes because it's such a fun word to say. Benjamin Franklin said, ignorance can be remedied, meaning not having knowledge, you can be taught. Ignorance can be remedied, but there's no cure for stupid. And the reason why is because the one who is stupid thinks they know everything. And that's what happens when you worship education, knowledge, or intellect, you become stupid. If you worship self, you become lonely for a lot of reasons. For one, it's an empty thing to worship, and so you just circle the drain because you're limited to just yourself. And also, you're lonely because people will eventually avoid you because other people don't want to worship you. And so you become like what you worship. The old you thought that way. In some way, in shape and form, before you knew Christ, you were an idol worshiper. You had a master passion that was not God. And some in this room had a master passion that were, everybody would say is dishonorable or everybody would say was sinful. Some in this room had a master passion that most people would say was honorable. But if it's not God, it's not right. If it's not God that we worship, if it's not God that we live for, then it's an idol. And so the old you thought a certain way. We see that very clearly. Verse 17 again says, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. Verse 18, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. And so that section refers to, again, the futility of the mind, that is a mind that is focused on things that don't profit, but also that understanding darkened. What it literally means is that there's no meaning, that we're aimless. That word here for darkened um, is actually speaking to the idea of being in the dark and just walking around like a Roomba. Right? It's not really working because I'm pretty convinced those do absolutely nothing. Right? That's what it means, understanding darkened. You don't want to be a Roomba. And just kind of going around, not actually doing anything, but just making a little bit of noise. goes on to speak of ignorance, which just means without knowledge, meaning you didn't know. And for, for all of us, before we knew God, we didn't know what we didn't know. So we didn't know how good God was, which is why the scripture says, taste and see that the Lord is good, because anybody who has known him knows he's good, and anybody who knows him wants more. Anyone who's close to him wants to be closer, because through experience, we discover there's no one that compares to God, no one at all. And so we were without knowledge. We were ignorant, but also it says this, that there was blindness of heart, now, that idea of, of blindness of heart is actually speaking 
of a hardness. So when we think of blindness, we're thinking we can't see, but the idea is that the eyes are no longer working. And remember, the heart is not the seat of emotion to those of their time frame. The heart is actually the seat of intellect. The mind was the seat of the will. And so the idea of blindness of heart means that we were dense. We could not understand. Our mind was like um, a stone. We were of stubborn heart. And so the old you thought that way. And that's what happens when God's not in the equation. There's a lack of meaning in life. We don't have the meaning that God intends us to have. And of course, if God's out of the equation, you can't answer that question. What is the meaning of life? Because we lack purpose. That's why some will say, in fact, many say today, and sadly many in the church, follow your heart. I mean, why would anybody say, follow your heart? The heart of man is deceitfully wicked. Above all else, nothing good dwells in it. Jeremiah 17, 9 tells us. So why would we follow our heart? Well, because it feels good. Do it, the generation before us said. Really? I mean, that's so base. It's so animalistic. It's not living life the way God would intend. It's not living a full life. It's just living like a brute beast is what that means. And so there's all sorts of wreckage that's happened in people's lives because they followed their heart. And and sad to say, the world in some ways doesn't really speak that way anymore, but the church has taken up that banner. And now people in the church telling other people, well, well, follow your heart. You know, you, you should be happy. Certainly God wants you to be happy. And so go ahead. Do what makes you happy. Well, that's not what we live for. That would be living for self. That would literally be worshiping self if you do what makes you happy. We need to do what makes God happy because we've been made to live for him. And so again, you remove God from the equation and then you're left ultimately with those in the past that simply said, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow you die. And they're probably right. Meaning if there is no God, then why not? If there is no God, why would you not simply eat, drink, and be merry? Because you have this life to live and then you die. But there is a God. And he's made us with a purpose. And he's spoken very clearly in the 66 books that we have in the Bible. And he's told us everything that we need to know for life and godliness. We have right there in our laps. And so we know how to worship him. We know who he is. And we know how to live a life that's pleasing to him. We know how to discover what our purpose is. But those that are outside, those who haven't yet met him, they don't. And so when it comes to this first thought, the old you thought a certain way, we need to understand this, how you think will affect what you do. It'll affect the way you behave. Notice the second part for us, the old you acted a certain way. Verse 19, it says, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness. This word lewdness means uh, no self-control. So licentiousness is the word, but it means lawlessness. Do whatever you want. And so again, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Now that word for greediness is an interesting word. Uncleanness just simply means impurity. So anything that's impure, whether it's, it's sexual that we tend to think of when we think of uncleanness, but anything that's unclean is what it's saying. So, so those who've, who are past feeling, they've given themselves over to lewdness, willingness to do anything, and to work all uncleanness with greediness. It means to gain what you want and to do whatever you have to to get it. And then once you have it, to do anything you have to to keep it. And that's what greediness means. So in other words living for self, and we're back at idol worship. So the old you thought a certain way, and of course, how you think will affect what you do. So the old you acted a certain way. And don't miss this. When you do those things and you give yourself over to lewdness, that is no restraint, eventually what happens is what's referred to here in verse 19, 
um, as past feeling. What it means is so hard that the person becomes petrified. They're callous in their thinking and their feeling. So they're able to do things they never thought they'd be able to do. Turn over to Romans chapter 1, please. Romans chapter 1. Here in this passage, we see the way the old man or the old woman thought and acted. Romans chapter 1, beginning here in verse 20, it says this, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. So in other words, since the creation of the world, God's attributes have been seen. No one can look out and, and, and consider the expanse of the universe and, and how intricate the human eye is and not agree it's been designed. The man who was championed by many as the smartest man who lived, at least in his time frame, Stephen Hawking, said way back in 1997, there's absolutely no question that the universe was designed. I agree. But sadly, he went on in one of his forums to say, but I reject the possibility of a designer. That's stupid. You can't have something designed without a designer. Nothing ever came from nothing except when God said, let there be light. God is the only one that can create from nothing. In fact, he's the only one who can create. And he has created everything. Time, matter, and space. And listen, he's created all those things because he loves you. Because he didn't have to create those things. But he chose to. And so, since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they, who's they? Everyone. They are without excuse. Because although they knew God, meaning they understood there had to be a God, though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts. Again, they developed idols. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into the image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Don't miss this. Verse 22 shows us that transition from how we think to how we act. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into the image made like corruptible men and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Again, they start to worship idols. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their heart to dishonor their bodies among themselves, meaning this, their desires, their animalistic desires, out of control, they become unhinged. Notice, in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature. Don't miss this. They served the creature. In other words, I think it's the NIV that says they served creation. And that's literally what it means. They served creation rather than the creator who's blessed forevermore. Listen, I don't want to destroy our environment. I don't want to see you know, something happen to our world that is not good. We are those who have dominion, meaning God has given us responsibility to care for this world, and we ought to. And we ought to be concerned about the environment. It's responsible, it's godly, but we're not to worship creation. And that's what we see happen today. Listen, we are the only part of God's creation that are his image bearers. We are unique above all the things that God has made. We are his favorite. Amen? That's the truth. We're his favorite. And we've been made for a purpose, to glorify him and him alone. And so God gave them over to this mind because they were rejecting him, because they wouldn't listen to him. And so they worshiped and served, meaning they were enslaved to the creation rather than the creator who's blessed forevermore, amen. Don't miss this. Because of this, because of all this thinking, 
that was not honoring to God. Verse 26, for this reason, God gave them over to vile passions, meaning he let them go and let them do what they're going to do. He gave them over to vile passions for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was their due. What's he referring to? Really plainly, what it says, lesbianism and homosexuality. It goes on in verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to the based mind to do those things which are not fitting. Verse 28, speaking to that issue that rises up in the heart of an atheist who really ultimately has a problem with God, a God they say that does not exist. But if you really were an atheist, you wouldn't have to tell people that you don't believe in God because you just don't care. But they have to because the bottom line is this. They have the same thing every person in this room has when we sin, and that's guilt. And nobody wants to live in guilt. So what do you do? You have to get rid of the law. But how do you get rid of the law that made you feel guilty unless you get rid of the lawgiver? That's the issue. Which is why verse 28 says that even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to debased mind to do those things which are not fitting being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of wrath, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. What's it all saying? What it's all saying is this, how you think will affect how you act. And that includes not just doing those things, but approving of those who do those things. Meaning this, it is sin to do those things. And it's sin to approve of those who do those things. And it's sin not to correct those who do those things. Because Leviticus 19, 17 is still in your Bible, which says, you shall not hate your brother, you shall rebuke your brother, lest you bear their sin. Meaning if we do not speak correction, if we do not rebuke where necessary, we're guilty. So again, how you think leads to what you do, and how you think and what you do leads to who you are. Notice what it says right there in verse 18 uh, first part there, that those who have their understanding darkened are alienated from the life of God. Meaning this, those who don't think the right thing about God, those who haven't lived for him, well, here's what happens. They're alienated from the life of God. That's the life that someone has in the old life. That was the old you, the old me, before you met Christ. That is anybody in this room who does not yet know God. You're alienated from the life of God. What does that mean? A lot of times people think of a life with God as, as being something that's super spiritual, something that, that is so clean and pure and, and, and holy that it's just no fun. But hopefully you haven't been so far removed from your salvation that you, that you haven't forgotten how bad it was. Because though you may have had fun, and though sin is pleasurable for a season, it gets old real quick, and it grabs a hold of you and takes more than it ever gives. See, Satan is a master deceiver, and he always overstates the benefit of what he offers, and he understates the cost. But if you ever lived a life of sin, then you know how much your sin costs. It costs you too much. And you're left not actually living, not actually enjoying life. And God wants more. Last night, um, we were at a friend's wedding, and, and it was beautiful. And as I was sitting there, just kind of watching things go on, because I don't like to dance, I was watching people dance, and I thought, it's cool. And I was standing next to another person who, praise God, doesn't like to dance. And so we were just kind of leaning against the wall, because that's what you do when you don't dance. And we were having fun watching people have fun. People were talking, people were laughing, people were still eating, people were dancing, 
And as I was watching them do it, I just kind of commented to the guy next to me, it looks weird, you know, but they're having fun doing it. And they were, they were having fun doing it. And I said, I admire it, you know, because I can't dance. And I know I can't dance. A professional dancer told me one time, I can't help you. You, you, you can't dance. And I said, totally fine. I'm good with that because I don't want to. Right? But I was watching a, a, a woman in the, here in the church, and she was doing the thing that you do. I don't even want to try to pretend that I could do it. And as she was doing it, she had this big smile on her face, and she was looking up as she was dancing. And I thought, that's, that's so cool. It's really cool. So you're having a great time. And then, and then all of a sudden, it, it turned into line dancing, which, which is cool to watch. And, and people were line dancing, and they were having fun. And it just reminded me of the time I tried to line dance, and it, it was ugly. Yeah. They actually told me to sit down. It's a true, true story. They actually told me, you should sit down. I Meaning I was actually distractingly bad. Okay. And so watching them do that was pretty cool. And then it turned into country swing, which, which was really cool to see. And, and people were having a fantastic time. And I just thought to myself, as, as everyone actually went up and danced, including the person next to me who said he didn't like dancing, all of a sudden he was dancing. And so I was all by myself just watching everybody have a good time. And, and I thought, how cool it is that the Bible describes salvation in one way, using the metaphor of a wedding. That we're invited into something that is beautiful, something that is pure, something that is fun. Listen, that's the life of a Christian. Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. He's good. And it's fun to be a Christian. It's, it's amazing to be a Christian. And it doesn't mean that our problems go away. In fact, we get new problems. We actually have more problems. I have more problems as a Christian as I, than I had before I was a Christian. You're saying, that's not selling me. Well, maybe so, but here's the reality. The worst I'll ever experience is here on earth. And there's bad things I've experienced. But I'm really glad that the closest thing to hell I'll ever experience is what I've experienced here. And then when I die, I go to heaven. And it's just amazing and more amazing and more amazing. Whereas those who are non-believers, the best you get is here. The closest you get to heaven is here. And that's pretty sad. And after you die, it just gets worse and worse and worse for all eternity. You choose. The old you thought a certain way. The old you acted a certain way. The old you was a certain way. And yet, here's the truth. If you always do what you've always done, you'll always be what you've always been. And God wants us to be something different. If any man, if any woman be in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old things have passed away. All things have become new. And so there's the old you, but then there's the new you. Notice this quickly. It says, but you have not so learned Christ, meaning there's something that's changed in your thinking, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. It goes on and notice in verse 23, it says, and be renewed or renovated in the spirit of your mind. Meaning this, the new you is completely different than the old you because the new you isn't being shaped or pressed into the, the mold of the world. The new you, according to the scripture, is renovated by the Bible. It's renovated by how you think, meaning we are made literally new. Which is why the scripture says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Meaning we need to be renewed in our thinking. And here's why. Because how you think leads to what you do and who you are. It's true for those that are living a life against God, and it's also true for those who are living for God. You see, we need to remember this. We were made for more. And we have been remade for even more. Isaiah 43 verse 7 says that we were created for God's glory, meaning we were literally created to worship him. But being saved, we've been made a new creation, and now we're created for even more. Notice this, Ephesians 2.8. It says, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, verse 9, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We know these verses. Attached to verse 10, for we are his workmanship, 
created in Christ Jesus for good works. Meaning this, we were made, all of us as human beings were made for his glory, that is to worship him. And once we do, that first time we give our life to Jesus Christ, now we are made a new creation and he has remade us for even more. He's remade us to glorify him. And again, how you think leads to what you do and ultimately who you are. And this is why the scripture says right there in Ephesians 2.10 that we should walk, meaning we should walk in a way that's pleasing to him. We should walk in that service to him. And our passage, verse 17 says, should same idea, that how we think should be different than the world. You see, it used to be called heresy. Now just now it's called a different perspective. It used to be called lying. Now it's called exaggerating or storytelling. It used to be called gluttony. Now it's called enjoyment. It used to be called disobedient. Now it's called being independent. It used to be called covetousness. Now it's called ambition. It used to be called profanity, cursing, cussing, foul speech. Now it's called edgy. It used to be called immodesty. Now it's called modern or contemporary. It used to be called gossip. Now it's called chatting. You will never hear me use the word chatting, by the way, besides saying chatting. It used to be called disparaging. Now it is called venting. It used to be called fornication. Now it's just called normal. It used to be called adultery. Now it's called doing what makes you happy. It used to be called whoremongering. Now it's called entertainment. It used to be called sodomy. It was called that. Now it's called preference. It used to be called debauchery. Now it's called having a good time. It used to be called murder. Now it's called a choice. It used to be called perversion. Now it's called being brave. It used to be called approving of sin. Now it's called being loving. But your Bible and mine still says in 1 Peter 1, verse 13, therefore gird up the loins of your mind, meaning change the way you think. Be sober and rest fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, not conforming yourself to the former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct because it is written, be holy, for I am holy, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. In other words, those who are in the church are not to live like the old you. We're to live like the new you. And when judgment comes, it comes to the house of God first, which is why the scripture says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will forgive their sin then I will heal their land. Because revival is oftentimes referred to as this thing that happens when God just moves around and people get saved. That's not revival, that's vival. Revival is making something that was alive, that became dead, alive again. That's speaking to the church. Revival is the church being the church and the byproduct of that is people getting saved. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, then I will forgive their sin, then I will heal their land. And this land needs healing. We need healing. But it means the church being the church, and that's not gonna happen unless we change the way we think. The new you, the new me should think a certain way, and of course that leads into how we act. That's why verse 22 says that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Put it off. That's the old man. That's not the new man. That's the old woman. That's not the new woman. Like we said at the beginning of this chapter, you were made for more. You're more than this. So when you're tempted to do whatever it is that you're tempted to do, remember, you were baptized into Christ, whether you've been physically baptized or not. You were spiritually baptized when you got saved. You were baptized into Christ, meaning you identify with Christ, which means you died with him. The old man, the old you died. Don't bring it back to life. That's disgusting. 
The old you died. And now you've been raised a new you. So walk in newness of life. It goes on to say, sin shall no longer have dominion over you. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body, which means this. The church, above all else, needs more than anything else, holiness. But the church is so focused, especially in the West, with all sorts of different things. The church needs church growth principles. The church needs church planning programs. The church needs a school. The church needs, you know, this and that and the other. And there's nothing wrong with those things in and of themselves. But the bottom line is this. What the church needs is holiness. The church needs to pursue holiness. And yet we live in a country where those who are Christians or claim Christ have the same rate of sexual immorality as those on the outside. Teen pregnancy is the same in the church as it is in the world. The same. And we watch the same movies that they watch. There's no difference. The new you should think a certain way. Because how you think affects what you do. And a part-time Christian cannot defeat a full-time devil. I didn't say that. Two generations before us said that. Because they were speaking to how secular Christians have become. And it's still true today. A part-time Christian cannot defeat a full-time devil. God can. And I believe he's looking for people whose heart is loyal towards him, who have a passion for him, understanding it takes a passion to conquer a passion so that we become holy like he's holy. The new you should think a certain way. The new you should act a certain way. And ultimately what happens is the new you should be a certain way. And this is why verse 24 says, put on the new man, meaning this. Put on the person and walk in that person that God has remade you and remade me to be. Amen? Listen. Before they met God, Abraham worshiped false gods. Jacob was a con artist. Moses was a murderer. Rahab was a prostitute. Ruth was an idol worshiper. Solomon was an idol worshiper. Mary Magdalene was demon possessed. Peter was a sinful man. Matthew and Zacchaeus were ripoffs. The man from Decapolis was super demon possessed. Remember, he had tons of demons in him. Paul was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man, meaning an arrogant insulter and a murderer. God can make anyone a new creation. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things have passed away. All things have become new. Every single thing has become new. After he met God, after he met God, David was prideful, lazy, an adulterer, a liar, a murderer, and a really bad father. Which tells me something. God can still forgive sins. And it doesn't matter how far we've been. He can come to our rescue and he can bring us close. Charles Osborne stopped hiccuping in May of 1990. Just stop. The last year of his life was hiccup free. He died peacefully in 1991 at the age of 97. God dealt with the physical problem. Phineas Gage worked closely with his doctor for years learned how to restructure his life, and in short, his personality changed back to the way it was. And he once again was a responsible man, respected by everybody who knew him. He died, highly respected, and frankly, a medical marvel. God dealt with the emotional issue. Roy Sullivan, having been struck by lightning seven times, noticed that his friends began to avoid him Many people begin to tell him they couldn't spend time with him because they thought that he was cursed. He sunk into depression. One day while hanging up laundry with his wife, a cloud came over and he went to run inside. His wife didn't run fast enough. She got struck by lightning and left him. And September 28th, 1983, he went into the house and put a gun to his head and killed himself. dying with the belief that God was out to get him rather than focusing on the fact that God had preserved him. 
and that God is only out to get us because he loves us and he wants to fix us, that he wants to forgive us and make any man or any woman a new creation. Which is why though David was a man who was filled with sin, after he was a Christian, he would write in Psalm 32, verse three and following, when I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. Selah, meaning think about it. I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Selah. Think about that. There's no one here who's done something so bad that you can't be forgiven. And there's no one here that's done so much good that you don't need forgiveness. Every single one of us desperately need Jesus. Amen? And so the old you or the new you, you choose. Would you stand with me?